Hope you're keeping safe and well. This is the ExtraTime.com Friday podcast. I'm Oshin Langan. My apologies to those of you who are waiting for us. We're out a little bit later today uh, than we normally are. Why are we playing British rapper Plan B in the background? It is because I'm quite unoriginal in my thinking and I thought, oh, this would be cool to play. He's Plan B and today we're talking about Proposal B. What's Proposal B? It is one of the three proposed new structures for the GAA Championship. Well, one of them isn't actually that new. It kind of goes back to what was there before. But Plan B, or Proposal B, I beg your pardon, seems to be the one that is getting the most attention. And we'll get into the detail of that with former Derry player and well-known GA analyst Conleith Gilligan a little bit later on. If you're familiar with this podcast, you'll be familiar with Conleith, who you may also know from BBC and now RTE as well, I'm glad to say. Um, he'll talk about how Congress works, how Plan B or Proposal B might work if it gets in, the rights and the wrongs of it, the good and the bad of it. Um, but yeah, next weekend is a big weekend because we could see delegates changing the championship structure forever. It does need change. My instinct is that that change may not come this time around, but it will come eventually. But that's just my opinion. And as I say, the only one on this podcast who isn't qualified to comment on sport is probably me. Before all that, though, let's talk to former Dundalk, Cork City and Dublin City coach John Gill, who had a decent enough career playing in the League of Ireland as well. He's now up in Warren Point, who are in the Danske Bank Premier Division, Premier League. And uh, we've been talking to John about the Unite the Union Champions Cup that was announced during the week, the cross-border competition. We get into the detail about how a cross-border competition might work if they were able to expand it a bit and why it might be good for both the Irish League and the League of Ireland. We'll also talk about the matches that are on tonight in the League of Ireland. Uh, But first, I guess we have to talk about Ireland. It was a good week, a 4-0 win against Qatar. Before that, an excellent win away to Azerbaijan. And... um, We have a particular focus here on how the League of Ireland players did and how more maybe might get involved in the international setup. Before all that, though, um, I'll just simply ask John, how are you? I'm good, Shane. Thank you. Good on you. I'm very, very good. Look, we'll talk about the possibility of some form of competition between Irish League clubs and League of Ireland clubs. The Unite the Union Champions Cup was announced during the week, but I think um, everyone would like to see an expansion on a cross-border competition we might not get an All-Ireland League, but certainly there could be some kind of expansion. We'll get into that. We'll also talk about this weekend's League of Ireland fixtures. But first, um, what about Ireland during the week? A 4-0 win against Qatar, and we did it playing good football. What did you make of it? Oh, listen, there's definitely been, definitely been progress made, Oshin, and it was a very good performance, albeit against a, a poor side. But we've played poor sides in the past and struggled to beat them. So, you know, there has been progress made. Um, and I think Stephen has become a little bit more pragmatic in his outlook. I mean, people are saying we played lovely football. We did, but we also played some direct football, but it was good direct football. We've, we've blooded a lot of good young players who will be the backbone of, of the international team for years to come. So we're moving in the right direction. It's been a good week for, for, for the country as a whole, footballing-wise. It's been a very good week for Stephen personally. So, you know, all is looking good. But again, I think you've got to look forward to next month you know the, the Portuguese game is, is a, in my view a free hit but we've got to go to Luxembourg and get a positive result there um, you know we've, we've, we've got to go and, and, and right the wrong that, that happened here because we should be going out and, and, and beating the likes of, of Luxembourg and, and Azerbaijan at home I think Stephen acknowledges that and I think if he can do that if he can get over that hurdle over in Luxembourg which I think that he will um, you know all, all will look bright for the Nations League next year and hopefully a good World Cup campaign we look like we've learned. There was one moment where Omar Valdeli got the ball in the corner and he was close enough to his own channel. And whereas before an Ireland team under Stephen Kenny might have tried to pass their way out of that, he just said, right, I'm just going to knock this long because that's the option. That's the sensible thing to do here. And he did knock it long and we chased it up. But it was sensible. Is that what you that's, mean that's when you I say mean, we've learned? Yeah, that's what, I mean. yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying about being pragmatic. I think... I think you know, sometimes as a manager, sometimes managers can pigeonhole themselves. Like they get a philosophy and we're not going to change. I'm not going to change. My principles are this. I'm going to do this. Well, that's all well and good on paper. But at the end of the day, in any managerial position, whether you're playing in junior football, all the way up the levels, results are results are paramount. Obviously, you want to get results playing good football. And there has to be a process to it and a thought to it. Um, 
But even even the likes of you say they're playing out, even playing out from the back machine when Stephen took over the job for us, two centre halves were inside the box, and we tried to play out. And particularly, that's what cost us, I feel, in the Luxembourg game at home. They set traps for us, like, and they're only a minnow. But they were able to acknowledge. They 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 were able to see what we were trying to do, set traps, and they and they punished us with it. Um, there's a lot more, pra- you know, uh, practicality about the way we're playing now. Pragma- pr- pragmatism. Um, you you gave an example of it there, and that's good. And that leader means that Stephen has learned himself. It, it probably his coaching staff have helped him as well. And sometimes you've got to forsake a little bit of principles to 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 go and get the end result. And and I think the fact that he's learned and he showed that he's learned augurs well for his his tenure going forward. And I don't want to be dis- disrespectful to previous managers because look, we qualified for a tournament under Martin O'Neill. We got. Uh, we had some great days under him Trapattoni got us to a tournament was unlucky not to get us to a World Cup Jack Charlton looked those days speak for themselves Mick McCarthy the same Brian Kerr uh, was unlucky but he is implementing his thoughts and as you say now it's being mixed up um, are you particularly proud and, and I say mixed up in a good way I mean the example we gave there of going long when, when they had to are you particularly proud of someone who has worked in the League of Ireland that League of Ireland players have a big uh, or or are having a big impact on this squad is it something that kind of sends the message out that there are decent footballers in this country there are decent footballers in this league and we can produce them and 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 the step is not that huge the other thing is as well with Brexit now there maybe we will have to keep more footballers over on this side of the Irish Sea for longer until they're adults and that's actually a good thing it's not a bad thing and look at the likes of Jamie McGrath here until he was an adult and now St. Mirren want to make him their 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 highest ever paid player. Is that a good thing? Is that one of the many positives that we're seeing at the moment? Absolutely. I think undoubtedly it will. I mean, I think most of the young kids are gonna to have to stay here till they're 18 anyway. Yeah. Um that's that's and that actually that gives that gives uh clubs we've a real opportunity here, Rasheen, to develop our academies here and the government should back them and put some fine some 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 money into that now you will get other people saying well we we can't afford it we've, we've just come through a pandemic i'm talking about maybe creating a small industry which would in the greater scheme of things won't cost that much but if you look up north again and we've spoken about up north the government up there back their football clubs in regards facilities they have a, a national academy up there as you know um andy i think andy Waterward is, is running it now jerry little was um they learn, 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 and a few of the other clubs. I think Glen Torren have have started their own academies up. We need, we've, we've clubs have an opportunity down here now to to develop players and cash in on the value. A bit like the Bazuno um, situation in Rovers, where Rovers got Rovers will end up getting one and a half million for Bazuno. That goes a long way to paying, uh, paying for and helping to pay for an academy. Um, as regards players here, we've always had good players here, but and and I'll even go back to. This, uh, uh, me, you know, Liam Scales plays for Rovers, but he, and he's done really, really well. Couldn't get into an Irish camp. As soon as he goes to Celtic, I don't. He hasn't even played a first team game for Celtic. He gets called into the, the Irish international team just because where you play shouldn't define whether you're good enough to play at that level. I worked with Jamie McGrath in Dundalk, and everybody could see the talent that Jamie has. Now he has come on a bit since he's gone to Saint Mirren, but like you're telling me that the Saint Mirren team he's in are way above the Dundalk team that he played in. Um, you know, so there's there's the there's small, there's, there's it's 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 a fickle fickle game. Our league is still probably um, not given the respect it, it, it deserves. Now, are are you going to play international football? If you, you play in our league, well, Jack Bourne has proven that it can be done. Although he's he, cameo roles before he went to Cyprus, he was excellent for for Rovers. He didn't look out of place in the international setup. Yeah. When he got into this, when he got into the squad, so like there are players who are capable of, of playing at that level uh, uh, that are here. I'm not saying every player, but there are individuals who who are comfortable in that and have the ability to play in, in the international uh, setup when, when they're brought in. So, you know, they don't necessarily have to go away to play it. It does help, and, and obviously, the higher the standard you're playing at brings on your game. But we have got players capable, and it's great to see players that have played here start that's starting to get into the squad, and, and it's nice to to have come across them when they were here learning the trade. I, I'm going to put something to you and you can absolutely slap me down. It's kind of like the, the old Bill O'Hurley thing he used to say about Dunphy and Giles and Brady. Sometimes he said, I used to think I was a football pundit and they reminded me very quickly that wasn't my role. I'm kind of going to do the same thing here. I watched Chris Shields last week at Windsor Park, absolutely running the game for Linfield. He's already been voted uh, Danske Bank Premiership Player of the Month when he was in Dundalk. We could see how important he was to that team. 
Could he still or should he have played for Ireland at some stage? Because I'm hearing an awful lot of talk about how one of the weak points we still have is that we you can walk through our midfield. And even last Tuesday night, Guitar got through us at times, as well as Jeff Hendrick did at times, and as, as well as Conor Horan played at times. Could Shields have played? Should Shields still be playing? Am I going completely off the mark there? I think I think maybe Father Time is not in Shields' uh, side, believe it or not. But uh, two or three years back, um, certainly in 16, 17, when, 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 when that Dundalk team, and Stephen knows them better than anybody, um, you know, for, for four or five years, Shields was the best player in this league, in my view, in his position by a proverbial mile. I've seen him, and I've seen him do the same thing in Europe in, against higher opposition. He, he's, he's undoubtedly probably the best defensive midfield player in this country, um, by a, again, by a mile, in my view. Um, and I, I think two years ago, possibly three years ago, Chris Shields could have gone in and, and done a job for Ireland. Absolutely no doubt about that. No doubt about it. His awareness, his, uh, his, 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 his knowledge of the position and what's required in that position. And, and it was something that we were crying out for. But because... Because we're looked down upon, our league is looked down upon, and and, and you know, it, it's not given a chance. Um, now, some people will say to me when they when they listen to this, he's been he's daft. He's not he's talking out of his you know what. But I'm not because I've actually seen the guy. I've worked with him. I've seen his attitude. I know his. I know how mentally strong he is, and he would have he would have actually absolutely done a job for us. Um, certainly would have. And and there you know and there will be more players like that who are capable of. You're telling me that Georgie Kelly at the moment in the form that he's in um wouldn't wouldn't be able to perform at that level. Now again, that will go that we were struggling to score goals until Robinson's got five goals during the week. Pat Hoven the same two or three years ago. Um scoring goals for fun. There's, there is no doubt in my mind that you put these guys into an international team where you make chances that they will score goals. So we shouldn't look down our nose at our league. We have some very, very good, exceptional, talented player players playing in this league. Um, and they, you know, they should be given more of a chance, in my view. Yeah, and I think one of the problems is, is they they don't get the mass support these players, you know, for 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 getting into the Ireland squad because people don't look at the actual football; they look at the league structure, and it's it's something I don't think we need to get into now. But the league structure and the actual football in the league are two different things, if that makes sense. The structure yeah, is not, I, you know, I yeah, think you I know the point you're making there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you totally, and we don't, you know, it's, it, the players aren't really helped by what's by the way that by, by, by the way things are done, but there are definitely players. I mean, and Stephen would have been one of the ones that was were, were, was championing championing for that when he was managing Dundalk. And um, Pat Dolan's another great champion of that. You, you listen, you read Dolan's column in the Star every Friday. He like he he fully agrees that you know he's he's been banging the drum for Irish base players for for years. Yep. Um, and, and and actually he's banged it even now for managers now he's got that wish because one of our own has got the job albeit he went from Dundalk to the to young 21s and now he's the senior manager and again even with Stephen there was a lot of and there has been a lot of flack oh he, he he's not capable of doing the job he's only come from the League of Ireland background it's all, that's all BS to be honest with you it's it's what you do when you get the job it's what you do when you're given the opportunity um, and you're starting to see now that Stephen is starting to come he's, people are starting to see shoots of of, of uh, optimism because of the way that he's doing the job and what he's doing with the job as regards blooding young players. I mean, I think we had four or five, under, we've at least four under 21s playing the other night in the first team. If you go through Bazunu, uh, Ida, like if you look who's played the last couple of, the last couple of weeks, um, you, you know, young players that are coming through that are probably still eligible to play the 21s. Yeah. I'll look, I so, we can look you know, all, all, is, all is looking green. But as regards what you're saying there, we definitely have had players and there are probably players here at the moment that are well capable of going into an international squad and doing the job if given, if, if given the, if given the uh, time to do it. I'll go back to what I said about Scales. Scales has played with Rovers, has had a magnificent couple of years there, was do, has done really well this year, goes to Celtic and a week later or two weeks later gets called into an international squad. Now, if you've been asked Shamrock Rovers, would he have got called in? I don't think so. And that's wrong. I would agree with you. I think just the way the league looks, if this makes sense, some of the stadiums or whatever, it just sets mm. the wrong image and the perception is everything. Now, I don't think Stephen Kenny would buy into that as much as other managers. I think he just looks at the actual football product and the actual footballers. Um, but certainly it, it it doesn't help sell the league. It doesn't help sell the league to, to, to maybe uh, managers who would have looked at players in the past. It certainly doesn't sell the league 
to the wider audience. But look, that's a that's a bigger debate and something completely different. Um, John, I want to move on and uh, talk about the league this weekend before we talk about uh, the possibility of an expanded cross-border tournament. I suppose there's a big one tonight. Your old team, Dundalk, away to Bohemians. Kickoff is at 7.45. It's... It's it's must win in a sense that they want to propel themselves away from the relegation promotion playoff spot. They want to keep propelling themselves away from that. Ben Harps and Waterford play as well in what is a big uh, match in that regard. And um, for Bohemians, it's also a huge night because they want to try and get into Europe and there's no guarantee they'll win the Cup. So this might be their only route. And I would suggest that they've put a positive pressure on themselves but with their performances in the last couple of seasons and not getting into Europe would be regarded as a as a failure of a season. Well, it would be because of the fact that the financial issues you you tipped on it there at the start of our conversation. Like the money, the money that's that's involved in Europe now is massive, it's so big towards budgets, and, and and it just changes the landscape for teams in regards of even you know recruitment who they can go for when you've got the finance to do that. Um, Bows Bows have uh, Bows have have uh, struggled a little bit. A little bit the last few weeks. If you look at their last six or seven results, they've gone through a sticky patch, Oshin, um, and that will always happen with with uh, with young players as well. They have a very very young squad. It's a massive game tonight because obviously Longford are playing um, Longford are playing uh, Drogheda as well, and then you've got Finn Harps and Waterford. Dundalk want to keep the momentum going, but they've, they they again they're they're down bodies tonight. Cameron Dunigan and your your Kafkas, the two right backs are suspended, so they're going to have a problem in that area. Um, it's going to be an intriguing game, um, and 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 I'm expecting a really, really, really good game. I can see maybe a draw, um, which probably won't, probably won't, probably will suit, probably will suit Dundalk more than than Bowes, because Bowes also have Rovers, I think, on Monday night machine, so they 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 will definitely have one eye on that. They they they, I don't know whether they'll rotate tonight, but you don't, you don't know they will definitely mix up their squad. So it'll be interesting to see what what team selections are, are out tonight in regards more so Bowes than than Dundalk. What about Dundalk? Is there a feeling of let's do this one last tour kind of thing from them because they're going to lose McElhenney and Duffy at the end of the season and they're two huge losses. And even when Chris Shields had his kind of, um, he's going away when people line the streets with flares to wish him well on his way out of the club, I kind of thought to myself, well, okay, yes, this is about Chris Shields, but it's also about these fans maybe saying goodbye to these players and saying goodbye to this phase of the club's life cycle. Now, how that ends, I don't know, but they know things are changing. It might be the same with McElhenney and Duffy. They might get one last push out of Duffy. I know McElhenney is injured because he's on his way out of the club. I think you're undoubtedly right there, and, and not don't, not only not only probably the two guys you named, but you're, you're you know the strong rumours that Patching is gone. Um, Cleary, you know, there's some marvellous players there, great guys who have done really really well for the football club, and they all want to leave on a high note. Um, and I know that for a fact. So uh, Vinny has done really really well since he's gone back in. He went back in when it was literally on the floor let's be honest and he's he had a great he had a great run of games done really well in Europe then had a bit of a dip but, but and mainly that was through injuries and uh, they had a covid outbreak and and and, and other other stuff going on in the background uh, they've come back now the last few weeks particularly as you uh, since the fans have come back into Oriel they've played four and they've won four fans people don't realize probably of of nearly all clubs in the league don't talk but when Oriel is rocking it makes such a difference and it makes such a difference to the players that are up there because I know the individuals a lot of the individuals up there it's a massive massive part of of the Dundalk the way that they play and, and, and playing at home and um, I think they all know that probably as you say it, it's the end of an era and they have a great chance to go out on their shield so to speak by either getting to a cup final I think they will make themselves safe safe in the league I don't think that's in doubt because they've got players back fit now and they've other players coming back with like David McMillan and, and Daniel Kelly will be back into the squad once they get their best 15 or 16 players available to them they're they're a formidable outfit so I think you know the stars are aligning I'd love to see it happen because I think those players and I think Vinnie Vinnie Peart deserves it as well and more so the fans the fans deserve it the fans deserve a bit of success up there because of what's happened there in the last 18 months yep I want to touch on two other games tonight. Derry City against St. Pat's and Shamrock Rovers against Sligo. You've, you've mentioned Rovers already and we'll probably go deep into them on Monday because that will be um, the day of the Dublin Derby. But uh, Derry and St. Pat's is an interesting one, isn't it? It is because if Derry get a win there and, and, and it's quite feasible and possible that they will because um, their home, another home farm hasn't been great but they've been on a great run since Rory Higgins has gone in and I know, I know both managers really, really well 
um, two very very bright young managers. But if Derry if Derry actually get a win tonight and Sligo Sligo are playing Rovers, it's an intriguing night because of the fixtures, the way they they play. Um, Derry are right on Sligo's coattails then, and and if 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 Rory Higgins could get Derry into Europe from where from when he took over, it would be an absolutely unbelievable achievement. And you know tonight they have a great chance to do that. Now Pats will have one eye on the cup semi final next week as well, so you'll have guys there playing for places, trying to impress the manager. And um, that's going to be a really really entertaining game, I think. Um, but if you again, if you're asking me, if you're asking me what way would I go, I I, I have a sneaky feeling that Derry will sneak that tonight, Oshin. Rory Higgins, he has certainly worked the oracle, hasn't he? He's done. He's in a very, again, I was with him for a year and a half in Dundalk. He's a very, very intelligent football brain. Um, very intelligent man. Knows the game intimately. Is not afraid to go about getting things done the way that he wants them done. To be a, to be a ruthless streak in Rory. Um, he can be really ruthless. Seen it on the training pitch. Worked with him on it. Worked with him on the training pitch. But also he has a, he working with Stephen Kenny. Um, you know, for for so many years, he would have a, uh, a a a very good man management background as well. Players would like him. Players do like him, and I think um, that city is going to have a very bright next couple of years because with Philip O'Doherty, with the with the the financial backing that he can give the club now, <clears throat> you know, Derry Derry are probably the next club that are going to come in. As we, as, we, as we, you spoke with there about cycles, Derry I think are going to be the next club that goes into a cycle where winning will become an, an, a, in our virtual habit. And you wouldn't deny the fans of Derry because they're tremendous fans. And that is a town that has been through an awful lot. So you wouldn't deny them. And I, I'm not sure if you watched that club, that uh, documentary uh, about Derry City, but it was fantastic. And you couldn't help but like Derry as a club even more having watched it. I actually played in one of the games that was on it, would you believe? That's how really? much I watched it. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, listen, uh, with, the, with, the, with the redevelopment of the Brandy Well, with 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 Philip Doherty, you know, being able to sell his business for the astronomical sum of money that he sold it for, and Philip Doherty's a very shrewd man as well, and and loves that football club, which helps when you have a chairman who really cares about the club. You've got a great group of fans, a magnificent bunch of fans, and then you've got a manager now who is hungry and is bright and knows the league intimately, and and will get the best out of players. All the stars are aligned there for Derry to have a, a super couple of seasons. And already they've shown their intent, a couple of signings they made, Duffy and McElhaney going back to the club. There'll be one or two more going, going there as well, I believe. Um, you know, it's it's it all augurs well for Derry. They, they are, I think, the go-to team, in my view, in the next will be the go-to team in the next couple of years. You mentioned there that you, you featured in one of the games that was on that documentary. Was it always a special place to play? The Brandywell. I appreciate it's it's very different as a venue now, but was was it always kind of a standout venue to go and play in? It was, and it was even more different then because you didn't have motorways, so it was a long, long trip up. Um, The ground obviously was a little bit old and that, but the the atmosphere up there was always brilliant because you didn't get a chance to play in front of crowds as big as what you get up there in most other grounds. So it was a special place to go. It was it was nearly a day. It was a day trip. And we went up. We played there. It was, it was when I played. It was Sunday afternoon, so it was just it was it was it was a great adventure going up there. And you were always respected by the crowd up there because they knew, in fairness, and they they appreciated that clubs from down here were prepared to go up and 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 get, you know help get them out of the out of the the wastelands that they were in when they were when they were thrown to the you know thrown to the to the, to the bin for for so many years. So. It was important that they got back into football. Um, we were lucky that we got them to join our association down here and they brought so much to the table. Just a great football club. Great, great football club. Yeah, I remember the first time I went to a game involving Derry. Believe it or not, I haven't got to the Brandywell for a match yet. Uh, sorry, the Ryan McBride Brandywell to give it its proper title. But the first time I saw the Derry fans was at a Cork City game. And they, like it wasn't a big game, but they travelled en masse and they just brought so much atmosphere. Um, so yeah, great, great club, great uh, bunch of supporters. Just before we move on, Waterford and Finn Harps, that's a huge game. Mark Bircham has done a great job with Waterford since coming in. I spoke to, a, uh, I don't think you'll mind me mentioning, I spoke to Vinny Sullivan during the week, former Waterford striker. Uh-huh. And uh, he said that everyone has a good word to say about Mark Bircham and he just has brought everyone with him at the club, which is important. And then obviously on the other side, you have Ollie and who doesn't love Ollie? Well, listen, I, I, 
going. I don't know Bertram that well, but he's yeah. he's he's transformed the club since he's gone in. I think it's helped with the change of ownership as well. It's brought a bit of stability to the club. Waterford again is another club that has um, massive massive potential. You saw that when they came up initially there a couple of years back. What a good Waterford team, and uh, and again, it's, it's no secret that they're they're a provincial team. But if you get a good a good provincial team, i.e. Waterford. Waterford doing well will we'll bring three, four thousand people. We'll pack that ground to, with three or four thousand people, and um, because it's a real footballing town, but it's got to be done right. I think the new owner has uh, the best interests at the club at heart. I think they've got a very bright young manager in, who I like him. He's a character. He's he's not afraid to say what he feels. And um, his players obviously love him. They, he's brought in some good players. He would also have massive contacts in England, which augurs well for the football club. And I think that they are if, if they can stay up, which I think they will. Um, they they will they will um they will bring a huge amount to the table and I think you'll you'll see the real Mark Birchin and the real Mark Birchin team next year. Um, I mean they're in a cup semi final. Um, they may have to go through the playoffs to maybe to stay in the league. But I think I think whoever is in the playoff, I think in the Premier Division, I think has a, a more than a, a, enough to stay up. So you know again it augurs well for the league and it, it certainly augurs well for Waterford. Um, Ollie. I mean, I know, I know Ollie Horgan. I know Paul Hegarty really, really well. I speak to Paul on a regular basis. I know how hard those two guys work, and they don't get the credit they deserve, Oshin. Um, a lot of people look down their nose at them, um, because it's you know geographically where they are, the stadium, um, and you know the way the two boys. I think the boy, the two boys, get a rough ride off referees, off officials. But you've only took at the job they've done in the last two or three years. I mean, Ollie Horgan. I've, I've said to you, I, I, I give you an example. I was watching another nineteen game last year. Sorry, two years ago, and it was in it was in Kulak in Dublin, and it was a Wednesday night, a wet Wednesday night. Went down to look at a couple of players, and at half time, this character come up the line, wearing a, it had, he had a hood on, and who was it? It was Ollie Horgan. He came down to watch a game, and was getting in his car at ten o'clock that night to drive home. That's the kind of commitment the mm. guys, the guys' commitment and his drive to make Finn Harps better and to keep them in that division. It's it's admirable, and you know what? And this might sound ludicrous. In my view, he, the last couple of years he should have been nominated for Manager of the Year because the work that he puts in. I know the hard work that him and Paul Haggerty put in, and they deserve everything they get. And I think they will keep Finn Harps up. Yeah, they, they work incredibly hard, and it's an incredible club and an incredible venue. A bit like Oriel Park, it's seen better days. It does need to be renovated, but there's just something special about it. And um, John, during the week, the Unite the Union Champions Cup was announced and the structure of this cross-border competition is that the first and second place team from last season in the Irish League, so that's Linfield and Coleraine, will play off in a semi-final and the first and second place team from the League of Ireland, which is likely to be Shamrock Rovers and St. Pat's will play off and then the winner of each will meet in a final, I think most likely in Windsor Park. Now, we haven't had... Um, a, a really big cross-border tournament since the Satanta Cup and what made that at the start was firstly it was different and secondly there was really good money for clubs um, this has decent money but it's not what you'd call a huge competition first of all how glad are you as someone who is now coaching in the Irish League with Warren Point and who would know uh, you know that league pretty well and obviously who has a genuine connection with the League of Ireland how glad are you to see a cross-border competition back and how much do you think teams on both sides of the border uh, need it I, I, I'm, I'm actually thrilled and I was lucky enough to be involved in the first Unite one two years ago where we won it we beat Linfield and it was a great occasion um, and I'm glad to see that they've expanded it and I know the hard work that Brendan Ogle has put in from the from the Unite organisation he's a big Dundalk supporter himself and he's put a lot of time and effort and he's he's really driven this, this tournament on um, and I think it's brilliant and I think it's brilliant that they've expanded it and that even the two beaten semi-finalists will get I think it's 25,000 euros each which you know it's, it's 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 a fair chunk of money I'd like to see it expanded again because I was lucky enough to be involved in the old Satanta tournament and, and the group stages of that that, that was a fantastic idea where, where they had two when, when they went to the two group situation um, uh, I don't know whether that would happen again uh, home and away I'd like to see it happen like two groups of four two from each possibly two two club, four clubs from each jurisdiction I think would work I think there's an appetite there for it from the fans certainly from the players I think again financially it would have to be made um, it would have to be made viable and, and made attractive but I I think you know a lot of people are saying in all, I don't think we'll ever see an All-Ireland League certainly not in my time and, and I don't think the clubs up north 
will, will from from being up there the short period being up there they're not they're not they're not really interested in that but there would be an appetite for a cross border competition I actually think it would help clubs as well even even if you could time it pre- prepare for Europe. Um, and 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 it's just something new. Get players get excited by it because you're playing. You're pitting yourself against different, a different venues, different players. There's a there's a a unfamiliar, you know, outlook to it, which which makes it attractive as well. And I I think there's massive potential there to develop this. And I think Unite through Brendan Ogle will try to develop it. We've gone from literally two teams two years ago. Now we've gone to four. Maybe the next stage. Maybe not next year, but a year after. Maybe go 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 to eight. So I'd like to see it developed. I'd like to see it teased out. I'd like to see maybe some cross-border competition with Unite to maybe tease out what way we can make this go. I'd like to see both governments get behind it, Roisin, maybe put in a little bit of money into the prize pot to make it attractive. But there's massive potential there. And I think it's a competition which is needed. And I think the fans have a massive appetite for it. I would agree with absolutely everything that you've just said there. From my experience of covering both the League of Ireland and the Irish League, I think the club's... In the north, even more so, wouldn't want it. And the other thing is, as well, is like if you have an all island league, who gets the European spots? And if there's less European spots, if you have less chance of getting into Europe as an Irish league or a League of Ireland club, you are not going to vote for that. So, for that alone, I don't think it'll happen. One thing I would say about some kind of cross border competition, and I'd love to see an expanded one, I'd love to see the return of the Satanta Cup. But it's very hard to see that happening as long as we're not running concurrently because the Irish League is winter football. It runs, what, August to April, whereas we we run from possibly next year, February to November. Can you see a change in that, John? Could you see the Irish League going to, to, to summer football at some stage or another? Might they look at the Irish League clubs or the League of Ireland clubs and say, well, actually, they are, they've done pretty OK in Europe. And maybe a lot of that is down to the fact that they're prepared going into Europe because they play summer football. There's no doubt about that, O'Shane. You've, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, and you're not going to, with regards voting for an all Ireland league, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. That's not going to happen. Um, but from speaking to people up there, certainly the full time teams, the likes of Kenny Bruce and, and Laren, the owner of Laren, uh, Glenn Torren, and, and I know Linfield has spoken, and they've had discussions on it. I think they realise now that if they really want, if they're really serious about getting good results in Europe and reaping the rewards of the financial gains of that, they, they are talking about going to a summer league. There's been, a, there's been a, a ongoing discussions and they're getting, they're getting, you know, getting more and more and more clubs are, are, are actually coming on board. Now what's happening up there is that there's, there's three, possibly four full-time clubs. They all want to, I believe, want to go to summer football. It's the part-time clubs who I think are maybe hold, hold, holding it back. But I, 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 I really think that if they're serious about doing well in Europe and reaping the benefits of that, I think you've got to go to summer football, even from the point of view of pitches. Now, I, I understand that they're, they love, like for instance, the Boxing Day games or the St. Stephen's Day games. There, They have derbies and there's great atmospheres and big crowds. and it's, it's, they're, they're kind of clinging on three o'clock on a Saturday. There's even talk of possibly getting more Friday night games. And some clubs are actually fighting against that, would you believe? Even going to Friday nights. Mm. Some, some clubs want to get more Friday night games going on. I think there's there's a slow change happening up there, and I think eventually it will happen because I think a, a couple more clubs are looking at the the uh, the full time model. What's happening up there is, in my view, I think the league up there is starting to catch up, and there's nearly it's it's it's, it's it would be on parity if not go ahead of our own league if we don't put in the the the, the money that's needed down here, the finance financial. Uh, help that's needed down here from clubs. You only have to look at the grounds up there, Rashid. I've been lucky enough to be up there the last since July and I've been at a lot of grounds. Even Warren Point, who was a, who were a tiny, tiny club, the, the facilities that we have up there and the ground itself is is miles ahead of what's down here. And that's because the government um get behind it. Local councils get behind the clubs and and, and the clubs take a little bit more responsibility themselves um to put finances into into facilities. So yeah, it, it, I, I think it will happen. It probably won't happen, you know, certainly maybe not next year, but I think um, summer football is coming up there because more and more clubs see what's... what's. Uh, I think Gerald Lawler, the new the new chairman of the league up there, is even... Cliftonville, they, they, they've even talked about it. And Gerald Lawler, has, 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 I think, has said that he thinks it may be a, a good idea to look at and the clubs are, are in active discussions with regards how they can get over the obstacles to stop it happening. And the one thing we as fans always want is more games. And even in the Irish League, you can see that in the midweek games, they have the County Antrim Shield, which is big, and they have the League Cup, which is big, and they're generally played midweek, and they love it. And I think 
League of Ireland fans, we love the one of the reasons we love Europe is because you're playing someone different. And it also gives you a chance to prove that you're you're better than your normal circumstances, if that makes sense. Because even if you win the League of Ireland, people say, ah yeah, but you know, you're beating other League of Ireland teams, so what? That that's the kind of the cynical outsider's attitude to it. Whereas if a team wins in Europe, like doing what Dundalk did in, in, in Europe a couple of times, people really pay attention to that. And Rovers the same to be fair. And Larn did it in the Europa Conference yeah. League. Uh, this season as well like they they went on a run and Linfield have gone on a couple of runs and I think you you wouldn't get it wouldn't be as big a deal as doing it in Europe but it would certainly just create a freshness and there'd be something different and that would be good if you could get teams from the Irish League playing the League of Ireland teams in in a competitive environment and one of the issues with the Satanta Cup towards the end was just the season's not running together Um just it it, it, it kind of killed it also I think the money kind of faded a little bit in the end but I just think it would be great to get it going for all those reasons. And it would be competitive as well, John. You've mentioned it there. The quality of, especially the top maybe three or four teams in the Irish League wouldn't be far off the Irish, the, the our own Premier League, if I can put it that way. The no, League of Premier it's, Division. It, if you, I think the big thing up there is that there's, 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 there's probably four teams that I think would come down here and, and would, would hold their own. And, and, and they, they would make our league competitive. But the difference up there is that Four, the four top teams up there are, are, are unfortunately miles ahead of the rest the, yeah. the rest of the pack you, you see some ham- we've taken a couple of hammerings that we've taken a hammering this year ourselves of, of we've beaten 7-1 we don't see like big cricket scores down here but you will see it up there 4-0s 5-1s unfortunately the, lower, the, the, the smaller teams up there have a little bit of catching up to do but getting back to the Satanta I mean if you could if you could collaborate both seasons can you imagine having that tournament in pre-season Look at the advantage that would have to, to the teams preparing for Europe, or yep. if you had it, if you had it maybe just before Europe, and you, you're getting really competitive games with big crowds, and it, it definitely would help both both anybody that the six teams that would be in Europe from both leagues it would would help it would enhance their chances greatly, in my opinion. Yep. Look, there's many structures you could have, but I think we'd all love to see an expanded cross border competition. John Gill, look, it's been a real pleasure having you on the Extra Time.com Friday podcast. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, O'Shean, and, and I'm sure I'll bump into you soon up north. You will indeed. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Well, time now to talk about GAA and the proposals for structural change to the championship, which will be voted on at GAA Congress next week. If you're confused as to what Congress is and how it works, we will get into that with Connolly's Gilligan, a formerly of Derry and, of course, now a well known coach and analyst. After we recorded this chat, the GA, I don't know if you'd say confirmed figures, but certainly they were in contact with um, with people about figures. And John Fogarty of the Irish Examiner was tweeting about this last night and there's more about it uh, today on the irishexaminer.com and in the paper. Um, basically, one of the things out there and one of the discussion points of all these proposals is, will it affect revenue? Will there be more or less money made from games? Well, the GAA say, Basically, there mightn't be much difference. The Gaelic Players Association, who are very much in favour of Proposal B, by the way, have released a statement this morning, that's Friday. They say the Gaelic Players Association are delighted that the GA has confirmed there would be no meaningful financial impact should Proposal B be backed at Special Congress, with only a 4.1% difference between any eventuality using the GA's surprisingly conservative attendance figures. Given that this has been a concern expressed, we're happy to see it now clarified as it should put delegates' minds at ease on this matter. The decision can now be made solely on uh, on the widely acknowledged need for change, fairness to all counties and the development of players and counties across the country. Uh, That statement from the Gaelic Players Association about the figures around Proposal B and how it might affect negatively or positively what's made from games. We will talk about that. We'll debate that with Conlick Gilligan in just a second. But before we do, before we talk about that, a rather special story from Balahi during the week. Declan Brown, whose father passed away and was buried the morning of a match, came off the bench for Balahi and helped them secure a very important victory. His dad, Damien, a great club servant, uh, will be sadly, sadly missed. And his teammates, Declan Brown's teammates, at the end of the match, when the final whistle was blown, all ran to him. And showed great support and um, it was a really special moment. Uh, Conley Gilligan, um, who we spoke to, as I say, before all those statements were released by the GPA and all that. Um, we spoke to him about this as well. And I put it to him that it was just a, a very special thing that we saw 
at that game in Derry during the week? Yeah, look, it was a very difficult uh, week uh, for the Blahy Club. Um, in the same week as that tragedy with Damien Brown uh, passing away, they also had a very serious car accident with uh, young Michael Mulholland, who's still very seriously ill in hospital and would send her wishes to him. His father, John, would have would have been a, a stalwart for the Blahy teams in the early 90s that were very successful. So in a very tough week for Blahy, for that game to be called off last Saturday night, then refixed, and uh, I had the fortune or misfortune over the last 10 years where Declan would have been their man marker, so it have been kicking me up and down a lot. So I've got through him very well, and you know, a super fella, um, a super footballer, and the Brown family have just had so much to endure with um, with Damien's own father, Sean Brown, um, murdered by uh, the LVF while just as chairman locking up club grounds. Um, so that family have had to endure more than most, and Damien would have been the, the main driving force over the last 25 years, just to try and get a bit of justice for his father, and, and that fight remains. But for Declan to come off the bench with 10 minutes to go, when the Lai were struggling, and when it looked like Newbridge had just done enough to win the game, and it then it just turned on that, and uh, I think coming on to Rapture's applause, and I think even the Newbridge supporters there at the final whistle, while they were disappointed, probably wouldn't have begrudged uh, the Belahi community that win that night because it was something special and in a game that they weren't expected to win. Um, having had a poor enough league campaign to the to look forward to, Newbridge wouldn't have expected to win that game. But just that's what the GA is all about. I think you've seen enough of it in social media, the clips and what happened and on the final whistle, everybody running for Declan. And I look at just, it was something special. It's one of those moments that the hair stands in your neck a wee bit because... Teams win and lose all the time, but things like that transcend the result. It's a good point you make there that it's what the GA and I would argue it's as well. All sport clubs are about they're not they're they're kind of partially about the sport and the health and the fitness side and you know people getting to play matches, but more so they're about the social circle and the support circle that you get. And while nothing will make the Brown family feel better this week, it's good for them to know that the support is there and the Mulhollands as well, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, it is. Look, and I suppose everybody says it whenever there's tragedy within GA clubs, they rally to such a degree, whether it's organising, uh, raising money for some some cause, whether somebody passes away, organising funerals, helping with parking cars, you know, all those things. The GA is much more than just sport and football or hurling or camogie or whatever it is. You know, it's a charity group, it's a support group, and it's something that most other sports in the world just don't have that ethos it's just not there it's, it's communities whether you're in a big town a big city or in a very rural club the one thing that they all have in common is a great pride and, and purpose in their people okay let's talk about the championship structures because next weekend there will be a big vote at GAA Congress now for those of you who are not familiar with GAA Congress it's this pretty amazing thing where delegates from every county board be it in Ireland or abroad come together to vote on proposed changes to the GA. Sometimes these are really small changes like, you know, what colour paper you use to mark subs coming in or one last year or the year before was an odd one. They voted to stop joint captains lifting trophies. The presentation to joint captains are now a thing of the past. That's an odd one. It also votes on massive things like the structural change of the championship. Now, anyone who has even a passing interest in Gaelic football will tell you that the championship structure is unbalanced. It's been a debating point for many years. It does need to change. And what they're proposing is basically the league will become the championship, but it's a bit of an odd one because you have to keep the smaller counties happy or the weaker counties, whatever way you want to put it. So you nearly get punished for being a lower end division one team. So if you finish eight to six in division one, your championship is over. But if you finish top of division four, you go into quarterfinal playoffs. Um, and it, it's a bit strange in that sense. Conley, what have you made about the, the, the debate so far? Because plan B is this plan is called, and I appreciate I didn't get all the detail in there, but we can discuss that. Plan B is this one is called, is the one that the GPA, the Gaelic Players Association, is favouring Michael Dignan, who's the uh, Offaly County Board Chairman and a well-known GA pundit has spoken in favour of it. Um, I saw Brian Fenton today of Dublin. has He's he's come out in favour of it. Um, but at the same time, there's been a little bit of kind of negative reaction to it. Brian McAvoy of Ulster has said it's it's not a great plan. He doesn't see it working and he's not in favour of it. And I can understand from the Ulster point of view how 
they would not be in favor of change because the Ulster Championship works. But what what have you first of all? What have you made of the debate about the potential uh, changes? Well, look, there's so many vested interests in this, and rightly so. And, and I heard what Brian McAvoy had to say on it, and it's very hard to argue with him. Brian McAvoy's a great deal, and everything he does is for the good of the GAA. So when Brian McAvoy says there's a problem, I'd be inclined to listen. Um, the problem I would sort of see is that there isn't really much debate. It's everybody giving their opinion. And at the moment, outside of Brian, I haven't heard a huge amount of people looking for something different. It seems to have been that the overwhelming majority of people are looking for Proposal B. And I've looked at it. Proposal B is not perfect, as you outlined. But if the options on the table is Proposal A, which isn't fit for purpose, or Proposal B, or Proposal C, which is do nothing, I would opt for B personally. Um, But I do see the downfalls, and particularly when you look at Ulster, you know, and Ulster councils and provincial councils that do such good work. Um, whenever the provincial championship is worthless, teams stop putting effort into it and it'll die a death. And like Ulster has been brilliant over the last number of years. It throws up big crowds. The provincial councils rely on that funding. And the provincial councils do a lot more work than, than just run football matches. You know, you have the likes of uh, Ulster Council, they would provide services around you know, access to support for disabled kids and adults, you know, support services and bereavement. There's so many other bits that's outside of the game. So I can understand why provincial councils, you know, wouldn't be mad keen on that. Um, And I think what Brian has said has to be respected. But looking at what's on the table, the number of games they have now compared to what they're going to have next year. And while there'll be losers in terms of where they finish in the league, I think overall proposal B will be positive. Does it not undermine itself with the fact that you can be in Division 1 and not go on in the championship, yet someone who's in Division 4 can get further than you if they top Division 4? So basically, like the the worst team in Division 1, we all know it, right? Let's be honest. The worst team in Division 1 are 10 times, well, maybe not 10 times better, but they're way better than the best team in Division 4. But this rewards the team that finishes in Division 4 better than it does the bottom three in Division 1. Yeah, I think, look, it does, and it doesn't serve the teams that are really chasing that leading pack hard. Because if you looked over the last 10 years, the top two teams that get promoted into Division 1 statistically aren't able to stay there for any longer than two seasons till they go down again. So it's very hard for them teams to get momentum. What this proposal does is it looks at Division 3 and Division 4, and then the next group of teams in Division 3, and it gives them a real good shot at this. Because if you look at teams like Derry, if they're up in Division 2 now, if they could put a league run together and they could qualify for this, the only way for those types of teams to really benefit and really progress is by playing the best teams week in and week out. And if they could do that, then brilliant. They've got their seven league games that to all intents and purposes are champion league type championship matches. And I think that'll be brilliant. And for teams like that in the seven games, the unfortunate part for this proposal is that they haven't thought it out better so that all of Division 1 don't get into that structure. They could seed it, they could have it some other way, but I think, yeah, yeah you absolutely have to have a carrot for Division 2, you have to have the carrot for 3, um, and possibly the winners of 4. But I'd say to that, I think they needed to come up with something different. But look, we could talk about the rights and wrongs of this proposal and what we would like to change. We have to vote on the proposal here as it is, and unfortunately, the changes aren't there. For me, if I was looking at what I would love like, I believe that the provincial winners should be getting an automatic place in this. So, for example, if Tyrone were to win the Ulster Championship but finish fifth in Division 1, that, that would mean the sixth team in Division 1 would then qualify because Tyrone already were there. Something along those lines. Because I think, I remember hearing during the summer, Jim McGuinness and Peter Kahneman debating the rights and wrongs and, and whether it demeans the Ulster Championships as it went before. And Peter said no. Jim said yes, and I think there's probably merit in both, but the Ulster Championship, probably Leinster less so. I still think there has to be something there um, in terms of straight knockout football for them teams. From the coaching point of view, does this give the smaller teams or the teams that don't have as much funding as some of the bigger counties or the counties that just aren't as good, 
as some of the bigger counties a chance to close the gap because that's one of the other arguments that there's a wide gap there it will never be closed or it's impossible to close it as it is does this do anything to change that um i think there will be one or two teams as in what happened whenever the back door was introduced you had a number of teams that really threw their lot behind it and done really well in it and you had other teams that it was always a disaster for so i think there will be teams that will benefit from this will the gap close it's hard to see the gap closing because the top five teams of Division 1 will be where the winner comes from anyway. The winner of Division 4 playing off with the winner of Division 3 with them other teams Division 2. Like, with all best will in the world, it's very hard to see any of them teams getting past a quarter final and making a cut at it. But what it does do, it does expose them to that type of level. And that's the only way to improve. And I know the arguments is going to be there by Shane. They'll be cannon fodder for the big teams coming through. But I'd heard last year, you know, um, Turlo O'Brien saying that Carlo deserved a crack and to be in the main competition. And like there are counties that are at the bottom end of that that still want to be part of that. And at least this gives them a bit of daylight. If they can improve and they can get better to the point where they win their league competition in Division 3 or Division 4, then they're going to get a shot at the big boys. And look, I think it leaves something for everybody there. And I think within the GA, because it's such a democratic democratic uh, association. I think everybody's voice has to be heard and has to be respected. Enda McGinley was on Off the Ball during the week. Of course, we would have worked with Enda on BBC. You would yeah. have played against him uh, when Tyrone would have met Derry. And now he's managing Antrim, who he did ridiculously well with this year, got them promoted in the league. And then against Armagh, okay, they, they were beaten well in the end, but they showed signs of progress. But the point he was raising, and I'm paraphrasing him here, and I hope I, 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 I do his words justice, was very hard to hit for him to tell his players to give the same level of commitment as, we'll say, Dublin players and Mayo players are giving. When they know themselves, they are not going to win Sam Maguire. But now there is a bit of a carrot, and maybe that makes it easier. You know, if you finish top of Division 4, I know they're up in Division 3, but if you finish in Division 3, you'll, you'll be in the main draw, you'll make the quarterfinal, uh, preliminary quarterfinals, but even outside of that, and this is me adding to Enda's comments, although I'm sure he would have said this himself, even outside of that, if you don't make those preliminary quarterfinals in the main draw, the Sam Maguire, you still get a crack at another competition. So there's something to play for. Is that one of the, the good think, things of this structure? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is where it's at. And I know there's a lot of scepticism around the Talton Cup, and rightly so. Um, you know, the Murphy Cup probably was brought in as to be one thing and promised to be one thing but I remember Antrim playing in a final of it and look and I know one or two of the Antrim players that won the final that day and they cherished that getting up the steps of the Hogan stand to lift the cup is it, something to be cherished but again the fact that the game was on at 12 o'clock on a Saturday before a all Ireland quarter final that wasn't fair and that's where the scepticism for the so-called weaker counties come in because it was promised status and it wasn't given and I think if the Talton Cup is to work it has to be given the prominence it has to be given the funding the winners of the Talton Cup have to have all the trappings the same the winner is of Sam Maguire and I think if they can do that I think it's a great competition and for me that is where development will happen if you could get because the difference between Division 3 and Division 4 or the top end of Division 2 and the bottom end of Division 1 there's not much in it so it's all at a level and if you look at all the league competitions you know every team is very very happy and will celebrate winning a league division 3, 4 or 2 so this should be no different and I don't think it will be any different and I think this is the one winner, is that if you finish in Division 3 or Division 4 and you miss out on that, then you have something to drive at. And I think for all those counties, that's where progress will happen. And if you can beat them other teams, it gives you momentum and impetus for the next year. Because what's happening now, not so much from the pandemic, but a team goes out of the championship early, a player maybe coming from a weaker club that aren't going to do anything, an offer comes from America to head out there for the summer and they head away that player's lost for the year, whereas now, suddenly, well, the championship's over. Yes, with the Talton Cup, if they could win it or have a good run at it, it gives them the momentum and the spark to want to go at it the next year. And for me, it does a number of things. It keeps the enthusiasm there for supporters. It keeps the enthusiasm there for players who want to improve. And it'll stop the merry-go-round of managers in, managers out, players in, players out. I think it can only be a good thing. And like, if you look at Antrim this year, the progress they made and they were at the wrong side of a 12-point defeat to Armagh, which was very unfair because they played brilliantly mm. for about 45 minutes of that game. Had they ever got into a Talton Cup this year, they'd have been very hard to beat. And again, when you have people again to McGinley in charge, 
You have Mickey Hart in charge of Louth. You have uh, McEntee in charge of Slego. You've got big, big GA names now managing in these weaker counties. And for me, that's the thing that'll bring them on because everybody will want to play for these people. Do you think that because delegates mightn't be 100% confident that all the plot holes have been filled by plan B, that they might stick to what they know, because that's what people tend to do in the face of change. If they're in any way doubtful about it, they stick to what they know. The other thing is, 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 and you raised the point earlier on, there hasn't been much of a debate. There's just been people saying, I back this, or I don't back it. And there's been more people saying, I back it. But of course, the GPA and Michael Dignan and Brian Fenton are all people when they talk, you listen to them. But the people who actually vote on this are delegates from county boards, people we, we, we don't know, people we may never have heard of unless you follow GAA day to day, minute to minute, which I appreciate you and I do, but not everyone does. And a lot of it is under kind of under avail because the ballot is secret. So no one has to say what way they voted. Does that, I'm not sure if worry you is the right term to use, but do you think it might not get through because of that, because of everything I've just outlined there, that kind of fear of change, because it like it makes sense to change the championship. It's it's not fit for purpose. But of course, that's been the way for about 20 years now, and they haven't changed it. So why would they do it now? The worry would be is that the GAA in itself hasn't come out and said what they would like. That'd be my worry. Um, normally, I suppose, I've listened to a couple other podcasts, and the same point has been made. If the GAA wants something to change, they'll come out. You know, they'll fight for it. They'll tell the reasons why they would like it. Um, they haven't done this, which would worry me, which would make me wonder, is proposal B what they want? Um, this year, Congress is a lot smaller because of COVID. I yeah. think there's 67 delegates this year. Is that right? I don't have the figure. I think there's 67. It's, 32 it's, county yeah. boards. 32 county boards. There's 14 overseas votes. I think the provincial chairman have a vote. And I think the GP have a small number of votes. So... Within that, and I read a piece from Cahar O'Kane when he was talking about how the, the votes would break down and how tight this vote could be, the 14 overseas votes tend, according to Cahar, to always go with the GAA, if that's uh, to be believed. So this could be very tight and it will come down to a small number of votes, I would imagine. The GPA have voted 80% plus for change. Uh, but I'm not convinced it will go through. I think there's a an overwhelming majority of players want it. But Congress, and while there's brilliant people and brilliant delegates, um, the fact we don't know how counties are voting would be the big worry. And the fact that Congress actually voted to keep the vote secret would worry me. And there's no point beating about the bush. That's a worry. Like If you're not worried about your reason for doing something, make it be transparent so everybody knows where everybody else is voting and who's for it and who's against it. But it's... You toss a coin in this one and it might go through, but it, it very equally might not. Is the worry for you that even if this doesn't go through, that's the end of the debate? Uh, the GA or whoever might say, well, we put changes out there and people said no. Or do you think no matter no. what happens, because Cara O'Kane in that article you mentioned there, this is like a Cara O'Kane tribute podcast. <laughs> this, is, this is about the fourth mention he's got, but rightfully so, because yeah. he's written some great stuff over the last couple of days. Great stuff. He just said, he just said what his point was in his opinion piece um, was that, of course, change is needed, but plan B isn't perfect. So maybe we should wait and do it right rather than trying to put something through just for the sake of it. But are you worried that if, if it doesn't go through, that's that for another while and a good while? Yeah, that could be the case. And you mightn't get anything on the table for another number of years. But I think there is a swell of opinion between players and generally people that something has to change. You know, this proposal isn't perfect, but it's the best thing on the table. You know, if they vote to come back again at it, they may be able to get it better. But no proposal can be all things to all people. There will be winners and losers in every proposal. You know, this one, is it the best option? It's probably not, but it's probably the least worst option. Yes, there's going to be losers at the bottom end of Division 1. But if you, in, a, in another way, if you put them other two teams in, you put them in in place of the winners of Division 3 and the winners of Division 4. So basically what you would have would be what happens in club football at the moment? Division 1 and 2 playing in All-Ireland. Division 3 and 4 playing an intermediate All-Ireland called the Talton Cup. That's the only other option. So I still think there has to be a curate, um for those other teams. I don't know how you get around on all those things, but there's a chance that it'll come back and there'll be a proposal to be better. It, but I don't curate, know if there will. 
Should the carrot to these teams be? Like, and this is a very unoriginal point I'm about to make, right? But in every county, you have junior, intermediate, and senior. And if you want to play in senior, you earn your right. You win the junior, you win the intermediate, and then you get into senior, and then you have to fight to stay there. Should that not be the case in GA? And should we not say to the teams in Division 4, well, look, sorry, but why should it be different for county teams than it is for club teams? And just structure it like that. Yeah, look, I think that's a very good argument. And for a long time, I can't see how sustainable is the one competition. You know, maybe 50 years ago, and probably it wasn't any different, there was tankings given out then where teams were getting by about 20 or 30 points as well. So it's no, it's nothing new. There is, a, there is a case for that. And it may be that there is two different competitions. And if you look at, I suppose, ladies football, Kamogi, the success has been at the three levels. When you win the competition at your level, a senior championship at club level, is no more desired or no more welcome than a, an intermediate or a, a junior final win for clubs. So like, there's definitely merit in that competition. Um, the difference being, I suppose, is that the amount of resources being ploughed into the top end teams, geographically, the amount of sponsorship teams in larger cities like Dublin or Galway can get changes the whole dynamic. Like Leitrim is never going to be able to get the same amount of exposure, the same amount of sponsorship as Dublin. So there has that, to be a better mechanism. And that won't, but that won't change that. regardless of championship structure. I guess their argument is, is, well, that's not our fault, so we should still be in the top competition because it's not our fault. We'll never get that um, funding and coaching system in place. What, like, okay, I know I'm picking just one example, but look at what Mead did, winning the intermediate and then the next year winning the senior. And there are loads of examples in club championships all around the country of teams winning a junior or intermediate and then going and doing really well in senior the next year. Yeah, look, there is. Um, but there's also a huge amount of teams that go from junior into intermediate and go back into junior again. There's also teams now all over the country that are playing in promotion relegation playoffs and leagues. And there are teams not fielding promotion games in junior and intermediate because they don't feel they're ready to go up yet. Yeah. Like that's also happening. So it's not right either. Um, there's loads of arguments for and against this, but it's what has to be right for the county. Um, and from that perspective, there is no one size fits all. There is no panacea that everybody's going to be happy with. And this argument, this debate that we've had here actually kind of proves the point that you've just made. There are so many strands to this and you cannot possibly keep everyone happy with any structure because there'll be a fault in all of them. Um, yeah, but, and, but and, again, uh, within that, if, if you look at this new structure, um, I suppose you look at the many games, basically in knockout football, there's 27 different games. There'll be 81 matches in this format. I think that's the proposal that I read um, for proposal B. There'll be, sorry, 216 games in total, um, which is more than, there's, there's, that's 34 games more than will be in this, if it was a Super 8. So I think the more games you have, the better. And, for me, the one thing that you would really be able to improve is that there could be £10 million plus in gates receipts that could then be pumped back into counties that are trying yeah. to emerge and be better. So that there could be extra money there that could be pumped back in to allow Division 3 and 4 teams to get better coaching and just to see if we can make it a more level playing field. It'll never be perfect. And if you look yeah. at the curve up for the last 100 years of all earning titles, it's the same teams yeah. popping up every decade so that's not going to change but can we take the teams at the bottom end and just make them that much better in terms of coaching in terms of structure in terms of all the things that the top sort of five or six counties would have now and maybe that's how this will be sold to provincial boards and county boards but we don't know if that is being sold by the GA to them I haven't like yourself I haven't heard if they're actively encouraging a vote for any of the three proposals Conley we could talk about this all day because there's so many strands to it but I think you've fleshed an awful lot of it out very well there. And before I let you go, earlier on, we were speaking to John Gill, who's now working in Warren Point, having worked with uh, lots of League of Ireland clubs in the past. We were talking about how both Irish League clubs and League of Ireland clubs could benefit from some sort of all-island competition. Now, you played Irish League um, in the second tier, and you still follow it a bit. Would you like to see a competition like that as, a, as, a, as someone who's kind of a, a general fan, a kind of a, 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 a someone who has played it, but who, who's also kind of a, a, what I might call, would bandwagon jumper be fair when it comes to soccer? Bandwagon, bandwagon <laughs> would be probably would would be probably doing me a okay, great compliment. Good. But no, look, I would have a, I would an interest. I'd know a few people that'd be friendly with would still be playing in, in division in the Premier Division of the Irish League. So um look, I think it would be. I think there's more in sport 
that brings us together on the island down on Davidus. And everybody knows the problems that there's been um, in these competitions, you know, like the history of Derry City, you know, when the, the, the great program was on about that and the issues they would have had um, whenever sectarian, sectarianism was at its height. Um, I think that has gone to a degree. I think there's more players moving north and south in terms of transfers in and transfers out. And I think if you could get an all Ireland league, it opens up the country as a spectacle for, for football. And all aside, it just would mean you'd have more people interested in it from a television point of view. You know, you look at what's happened now in GA club games. They've been streamed every weekend. You could have 10,000 people streaming a GA club match for two teams where you have no interest in. Like, there's so many possibilities for a league, whether it be it a professional league, a semi-professional league. But whenever you split somewhere in half, it probably means the market for both is too small. And I think because we live in a relatively small island, there'll be no issue in terms of travel. These players are semi-professional always anyway, if not professional. So I don't see the issue logistically. I think it would do a great good. And again, it would open soccer up to more people to watch in the evening if they could get the right service. Okay, Connolly Gilligan, thank you very much for joining us on the ExtraTime.com Friday podcast. Thanks very much, Oisin. Connolly Gilligan speaking to the ExtraTime.com Friday podcast. As I say, that conversation was recorded before the GPA came out with their statement and um, obviously before the GA, again, I'm not sure, was it a statement or did they just contact county boards, but before um, John Fogarty's story about the GA talking about the figures and it is well worth reading John Fogarty's story in the Irish Examiner. Um, you can get it online, obviously, or in the paper. That's almost it for the extratime.com Friday podcast. Don't forget to follow everything that's going on in the League of Ireland over the weekend on extratime.com, reporters and all the main games. We'll be back on Monday. We'll review what happened in the League of Ireland. We'll preview the Rovers Bowls game, the Dublin Derby. We'll also talk about the Premier League, GAA and rugby. That's it for now. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.